What's up, everybody in Grip World? This is Napalm Jed Johnson, and this is episode 57 of This Weekend Grab. I just cooked up a pile of chicken and a couple burgers, but I'm all set for the first part of this week, food-wise, and now it's time to talk grip, brother. I'm joined by my esteemed co-host, Alan Hynek. And today we're going to talk with one of my best friends in the world, not just one of my best grip friends, but one of my best friends, period, Mike Rinderly. You might know him as Rindo, but Mike is a longtime grip guy and at one time one of the top steel benders in the United States. And unfortunately, he recently went through about of the same exact thing that Yuha Haru went through back in 26 or 2017. It's a condition called rhabdomyolysis. I believe that's how it's pronounced. Which, this stuff set in after he did a set of Poundstone curls, which if if you've been watching my YouTube channel at all for the last few years, I do Poundstone curls all the time, and I haven't gotten this. So why did Mike get it? We're going to find exactly why Mike ended up getting rhabdomyolysis later on in this call. Also... We're going to be discussing something that I've been getting a lot of questions about lately, the history of the Captains of Crush Gripper Certification. All three of us are going to discuss this in as much detail as we can, but if we miss anything, feel free to leave us a comment below the video. I welcome you to do that on any of my videos on my channel, by the way. If you want more detail on the content of the video or if there's something completely different you'd like to discuss, feel free to comment below that video. I just put up two new Q&A videos that were generated through this process. When you watch those videos, you'll see how the Captains of Crush certification works and can anyone deadlift 600 plus pounds, double overhand, no hook grip. So make sure to check out those videos. And also, if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the channel. I'm working towards 9,200 subscribers on my way to 10,000. And when you do that, make sure you click the bell that's on the screen because this will let you know every single time I upload a new video and you can watch it right away. Also, before you leave, in fact, do it right now, hit the thumbs up button. It helps out the sport of grip big time and can lead to the video that you're watching right now being displayed on the side panel of other people's laptops or desktops or it can be suggested on their mobile phone and could lead to future newcomers to the sport. And you know what the first rule of grip sport is. You tell everyone about grip sport. So hit that like button now, and it'll get it in front of more people's faces. And before I get started with the meat and potatoes of the show, I want to remind you that if you want the absolute best information on how to train your grip, then there's no better place than thegripauthority.com. The Grip Authority website was launched in 2010, so it's already over eight years old, and it's packed with info on just about every single type of grip training and feat of strength you can think of. In fact, earlier this morning, I added a brand new post with a video showing the system I just implemented for the first time yesterday in order to help me lift the Blob Father, the half 140 York Legacy Blob. If you're training to lift the Blob, you need to go get this post right now. Learn about this system I'm using at thegripauthority.com. Click the link in the description box below to join today for just one dollar. Episode 57, what's the good word about that arm, brother? Oh, it's, it's moving along. Seen some big improvements last couple of weeks. So uh, hopefully in just another few weeks, I'll be back to doing some more, more normal things. For now, I've got to kind of take it easy. But uh, seeing some real improvement anyway. Things are looking, looking up, unlike before. So. Well, that's really good to hear, man. How, what, uh, what's your, what, how many weeks do you have going forward? until you can kind of start working back into some uh, strength training? 
It sounds like, um, you know, as of right now, what my what my therapy officially looks like, they're actually having me do some some very light rows and some pull downs and and things like that uh, at the hospital. So it's looking like in probably another month I'll be able to pro- progress to where I'm doing more things around home. Um, so probably by August, I'm, I'm guessing I'll be doing some some more formal weight stuff. So it'll be it'll be quite light compared to you know how things were previously, and then it'll kind of start you know progressing back up to being my my normal self after that. So, but at yeah. least the the weights won't be won't literally be pink anymore in the meantime. So that's a that's a nice thing. So. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, I'm yep. glad that uh, some training is is on your horizon anyway. Even though it's still a month out or so, I'm glad to hear that things are progressing well. Um, yep. And I know we got another guy on the line right now where things are progressing pretty well. It's Mike Rinderly. We call him Rindo. Rindo, how you doing, man? Good, man. How are you guys doing? Good. Uh, so this is uh, the other guy in the line that you heard is Alan Hynek. So, hey, Mike. Uh, how you doing? Hey, good, Alan. How you doing? Not too bad. You probably haven't had the opportunity to meet Alan, right, Mike? I don't think so. No, we, we haven't met. I've just um, I've, I've followed you on uh, – I've seen you on, on YouTube, a lot of your YouTube videos and stuff, and I notice your, your posting frequency is picked up on the grip board. So – and a lot of your older comp videos, that's about the, the most I know of you anyway. Gotcha. Got some impressive lifts, though. Oh, thank you. Not bad for an old man. <laughs> so, so, Mike, we're good. I wanted to have you on here. Uh, first off, so everybody gets to know you a little bit more if, they haven't, if they're not aware of you. But uh, also, I know that you had rhabdomyolysis. Is that how it's pronounced? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Most people just call it rhabdo. Yeah, it's rhabdomyolysis. Yeah, so I know it was no fun, uh, and we're going to get to that here soon, but I thought what we'd do is go around one time, and uh, it, maybe each of us could talk about the feet of the week, the biggest feet that they saw. Um, so maybe you've got something, Mike, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I'd say it's probably a tie for me. Um, uh, Chez, uh, certainly MM7, and then uh, there was a, a YouTube video somebody posted, uh, Cashton. I, I th- I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his name, but I think that's his grip board name. Um, was repping a number four. I think he got three reps with a 20-millimeter block, and then he repped it out like ten times. I don't, I don't know what it, uh, what it actually um, – uh, rates at, but any number four for any number of reps with any set to me is is pretty freaking incredible. And um, yeah. I know uh, Chez was uh, was uh, really working hard to get that MM7, so uh, I had to had to put that up there as well. So I'd say uh, as much as I dislike grippers, I would say those uh, were probably the uh, the two biggest feats of the week that that I saw on social media. Yeah, those are those are huge, um, and I think I actually saw that video too. I think I'm subscribed to that Cashton guy, and I remember I remember a video earlier in the week that came up where some dude was just manhandling a number four, which, like you said, is is always a big deal. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, gripper certs later on, especially the Captain's a Crush gripper cert, so everybody can stick around for that. But what's what's your feat of the week, Alan? Um, Chez with the MM7 cert, that was the big one for me. Um, it was something he'd worked real long and hard for. And, um, you know, his closes, I don't know if both of you guys got a chance to take a look at those videos, but those were his dominant, uh, uh, uh Mash Monster 7 closes we've seen. He, he just absolutely destroyed that gripper. He made it look easy. So big congratulations to him. But that's, uh, that's definitely my, my feed of the week pick. Yeah, those are those are big grippers. I don't know what those grippers, you know, what an MM7 rates, but I mean, I you know, they're up around 195, 200 they, pounds probably. That's I, I was thinking they were pushing in the in the upper 190s. I thought the speculation was in the 197 area. So yeah, I could be a little that makes off sense on that because Rindo didn't. So what what grippers did he close at nationals? Was it 190 and 195 that he closed? I think he just missed the 195 twice. So I know he got the 190, and he was having kind of an off day um, and just missed the 195. He might have gotten the 195, though, now that I think about it. I I can't remember if he got it or not. Well, now, I, I, and I was, I was standing right there documenting and judging everything. I know that the first two 
or the the clothes or clothes that he got were e- not easy, but there were no doubts. Like I could clearly see that the grippers were or the handles were totally touching. And then after that, it's like he just couldn't put the set back together. Maybe his set was tired after that because there were there was quite a gap. He didn't he wasn't able to move it too much on his last two attempts that he took. But, right. Um, but it serves to reason, you know, if he even if he closed the 190, if he's fresh, he's going to have several more pounds in his pocket to use for the for the gripper close. So, yeah, yeah. congratulations to Chez. Anything else on that close that you guys wanted to mention? No, no. Just a uh, yeah, just a huge remarkable close. So, I I'm I'm looking forward to seeing him, you know, on the path to the to the Mash Monster 8 because the way he did this one, I I think he can can easily be right up there. Without doubt. Yeah, for sure. And I would say I'm not going to take anything away from that feat, but the thing when we were talking about saying feet of the week, the thing that popped into my mind is something that just came online, I think, yesterday from Thomas Larson. Um, He just bought an inch dumbbell. Now, I think I know the story of this inch dumbbell because he took a close-up of it, and it has on it that uh, that Slater's, uh, the Slater dumbbells have. Oh, I wanted to ask about that. Yes, yes. So... Years ago, and this this could be something that the international guys would be interested in, um, probably at least two years ago, Carl Skjelvik, who's also a member of the Grip Authority, and he was here in 2013, Rindo, for the Hold Fast Gauntlet. You remember him? I do. He was the international yeah. competitor, yeah. Dude. So he, he ordered an inch dumbbell, and as it turns out, with freight costs, it was only like... <laughs> Like forty dollars more shipping to to get two. So right. he went in or he yeah he went ahead and bought two inch dumbbells at the same time, and uh, barely paid anything more for shipping than one of them would have been. The only downside was I mean and this is going to be the same for any international order of an inch dumbbell is uh, it took like <laughs> something like four or Six five weeks or something there. like that to get there on the boat. Right. So uh, the feat was Thomas Larson bought. I, I think Thomas might have bought one of those dumbbells from Carl, and he instantly performed a thumbless inch dumbbell lift. I got caught on that. The list. Dude. That's... So this came across yesterday while I was training, and I'm like, that son of a bitch. <laughs> It was so motivating to me. So let me tell you something. I had this was easily one of the most frustrating workouts I've had in a while. Like I was throwing stuff. I could not lift 100 pounds added to the flask, and um, I was really struggling with the jug. And I, ju- I like frustrated, just about ready to walk out of the gym. I look at um, my feed on Instagram, and Thomas Larson goes and does the thumbless lift. So I'm like, golly! So I grab the inch dumbbell. And I'm like, I can't believe he was able to do that so fast. And I tried. I tried and tried. I could not get it off the ground right-handed. Got it off left-handed, but it was nowhere near a legal lift. I didn't, I didn't even save the video. I might have broken, might have gotten it off the ground four inches. But, um, man, it was so motivating to see that when it's the first day that he owns the inch dumbbell. Now, obviously, we've seen him pick up two-inch dumbbells recently at a competition. So right. and then he ended up buying one. So I imagine we're going to see some other pretty crazy stuff from him online. So you want to make sure to follow him if you haven't. And his name is what Alan Mister Dot Wide Pinch on Mister Wide Pinch. Yep, yep. It's appropriate. So look him up. <laughs> so yeah, very very cool. So those were the feats of the week. Um, anything else about the thumbless inch? Rindo, you going to step up and try that anytime soon? Yeah, yeah well, I probably have as much chance of getting a thumbless right now as I do with a thumb, so uh, either or. Um, that, that's one of my goals. I, I set uh, five goals when I started back into grip, um, you know, last year after uh, five years off or whatever it was. Um, I wanted to uh, – I wanted to uh, – two-hand pinch, 200 pounds in a contest, and I'm – I'm, I'm close. I think had the conditions been a little better at uh, at Nags, I would have got that. Um, I wanted to one hand pinch 245s, and I've I've gotten that. 
Uh, I want to uh, uh, double overhand deadlift uh, 500 pounds on an ollie bar, and I've, I've gotten 495, but I've, I've yet to, to fully lock out 500, so I'm close there. Um, and then I want to get uh, uh, a fat man, and uh, which I'm, I'm getting decent air. You saw after uh, after oh, yeah. the nags, uh, I actually got three or four inches on a fat man. So uh, I think fresh up at your place, uh, I'm going to get that one. And then uh, the last is, uh, and the one I know is going to take me the longest is uh, is the inch. So um, uh, right now I can I can hop it or uh, pull it with just barely stopping the rotation, but I, I'm I'm pretty far away still from a full lift. Yeah, well, those are awesome goals, and I have no doubt that you'll get them. And for uh, for anybody that's out there watching, Rindo's not a, a a newcomer to grip. He was in it for several years back from like. When did you start, Mike? Was it like 2007 when you first started? Yeah, it was like, you climbed like the seven ladder and eight. Yep, and then uh, I did it until about uh, 2012, I think. And then here and there, I'd come up to your place for a contest, but I wasn't wasn't actually training grip. Yeah. Now you've got a small arsenal of equipment down there, and yep. borrowed a few things from me, so you're getting some regular training in. Absolutely. So it's, it's good to see you again. Like to see it. So let's uh, let's talk about this rhabdo thing, man, because I I know the backstory, but uh, a lot of people don't, and I see a lot of people doing what you were doing for several months, which ends up being a contributor to this. And I'm not trying to uh, disparage anything or tell people what to do, but I just want to make people aware of what was going on when you were what you had going on and what led to it, and then that way if anyone else is planning on doing the same kind of thing, then they can make uh, an educated decision. So first off, Mike, what exactly is rhabdomyolysis? Could you tell everybody what that is? In case sure. Uh, it's a condition where um, you work out a muscle um, past the point. So every time you work out, right, you break down muscle fibers and then they heal afterwards, um, and that's how you get stronger or the muscle gets bigger, whatever your goals are, right? Hypertrophy or strength, right? Um, if you go past a certain point um, working a muscle, uh, and this is not fairly common, but it's, it's, it's more common in uh, really high rep um, type stuff, uh, whether you're a long-distance cycler that hasn't been going for a while or new to CrossFit or something like that where you have a, a long workout with a lot of reps, sometimes you can actually take the muscle fibers past failure and the cells in your muscles actually die. Um, and when that happens, um, they actually excrete all of their contents into your bloodstream. Um, which means the, the myoglobin proteins, uh, creatine kinase, uh, and everything else that's in there. But those two specifically are very toxic uh, to your kidneys and, and the rest of your system, really, your liver. But mostly what they're afraid of then is with all the myoglobin and, and such and creatine kinase in your system that your kidneys can actually get clogged and shut down. Um, which oh. then leads to you having to, you know, if, if you get to that point, then you're on dialysis until they can get it all cleaned out. And, and sometimes they can get your kidneys working again. Sometimes they can't. So, um, it, you know, just taking one set too far can sometimes, uh, um, uh, you know, really screw your life up. Very, very interesting. Now, what was the indicator that you knew something was wrong? Or maybe there was, there was one, like, deadline type of indicator, but what was the sequence of events, and how did you actually set this off? Yeah, so, well, I, A, I was stupid, um, and that's, I think, a lot of times how, how you get this, right? So there's two main ways to get rhabdo, and the one that's most common is – uh, when somebody that's either elderly or super intoxicated falls and injures a muscle and then is either unconscious or too old or too hurt to get up and they lay on the muscle and it dies, right? Um, that's 
that's kind of the, the main thing that hospitals see when somebody comes in with rhabdo. Um, over the last several years, they've started to see more exercise-related rhabdo. Um, and there's a number of factors that can contribute to that. I, uh, unfortunately, had them all working for me, and it was too stupid to, to realize what was going on. So, um, A, I had been on, I was trying to lose some weight uh, to get my girlish figure back, and, uh, and had been doing a, a really strict keto diet for, well, since nationals, um, since the day after nationals. So, uh, I had been only eating about 10 to 20 grams of carbs every day for two or three weeks, whatever that time frame was. So, my muscle glycogen, or, or basically the energy that the muscle cells use, along with ATP, was very depleted. In fact, it was probably close to zero. Um, so I was starting, you know, at zero, not in, you know, uh, which is a no-no. Second thing was um, I know how important it is to hydrate, um, and I hadn't hydrated at all that day. Uh, I think, in fact, all I had had to drink all day was coffee, which for me, I pee it out, I, I pee it out as fast as I put it in me. So I, I wasn't hydrated, and it was about 85 degrees, I guess, in my shed where I work out that evening. Um, and then, uh, because I don't ever really train biceps, I mean, I rarely do curls. You, I, I might do some hammer curls or something like that, but it's rare. I've, I've actually tried these pound stone curls a few times just to see if I could do them, and I always crap out at 45 or 50, or I think the most I ever got was 60. So um, I took it upon myself as a challenge because actually I, I had seen a couple of people knock them out on YouTube, and I thought, you know, let me try them with an axle. Um, mm -hmm. So I had zero muscle glycogen. I was dehydrated. It was very hot at the end of my workout where I had just done – I had just I, – I, I also have a slap tear in my shoulder, so I haven't been able to bench much. And I actually benched right before I did this, which – so I, you know, I, there's one exercise I hadn't been doing a lot of. And then I decided to do, instead of easing in and getting, getting my biceps ready to do curls, I thought, hey, my first workout for biceps, I should probably try to do 100 rep pound stone curls. So I, I, I thought, hey, I'll, I'll, it'll be easy. I'll do them on my 30-pound axle instead of a 45-pound ollie bar. That way, you know, I should be able to get 100 reps. So um, knocked them out. I was I I felt them burning like crazy about rep 85, uh, but I kept going. Um, and for anybody that doesn't know, poundstone curls are no weight on the bar, just do 100 reps without putting the bar down, right? So um, when I got to 100, I thought, well, I, I don't I don't want to be the guy that does 98 because he miscounted. So I knocked out another 15. And on the on the 15th rep, it was all I could do to curl that 30-pound bar. I mean, I literally thought my biceps were going to die. So I, they actually were. Um, so I, I put the bar down, and and you can see in the video of I, I actually videoed that set and put it on YouTube as kind of a warning for people. Um, my arms immediately raise up about 30 degrees, and then they didn't move at all. Um, from that point on, I couldn't I could couldn't straighten them. I couldn't curl them. I couldn't brush my teeth that night. Um, so then, you know, I, I went in, had uh, a protein shake, I think, and, and something else that, you know, with, without any carbs again, because again, I'm doing keto, um, and went to bed. And I knew something was wrong uh, because I woke up like every 15 to 20 minutes and peed like a horse. Um, I mean, I, it was like I hadn't peed all day, um, or the way you pee when you've been drinking beer all day. Um, and it was every, like I said, 15, 20, 25 minutes, I was waking up and having to go pee like that. So I knew my body was trying to flush something. Um, and then when I woke up Monday, usually for me, I mean, I know Dom's pretty well. Uh, I know what muscle soreness is supposed to feel like, and I've had really bad cases of it. Um, but this was something completely different. I, I, my, my biceps were swollen. Um, they were tender to the touch. I couldn't straighten my arms out. 
uh, without tremendous pain. I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't curl them without tremendous pain. So I suspected that I might have rhabdo or at least a mild case of it. Um, so I started drinking a ton of fluids, uh, which is fluids are basically the first defense against rhabdo. It kind of flushes everything out. Uh, so I, I drank about three liters of, of water and electrolytes on top of what I normally would drink that Monday um, while I was at work, and uh, everybody laughing at me because I couldn't move my arms. And then uh, Tuesday morning I woke up, and it was, it was even worse, um, and they were more swollen. Uh, so I just kept drinking fluids and drinking fluids and, and having heard some of the horror stories from other people that have had rhabdo and reading, you know, on the Google that, uh, you know, one of the main symptoms that you look for is when your pee turns dark. Um, so that at t Tuesday afternoon, I went to the bathroom and even with drinking all that extra fluid, I, I should have had like clear urine and my, it yeah. looked like I was peeing Coca-Cola. So, wow. um, Immediately, you know, went to my wife, said, hey, I'm on the way to the hospital. She was like, for, for sore arms? I was like, yep, for sore arms. <laughs> so, uh, you know, she, she made fun of me and uh, went to the hospital. Um, sure enough, they, uh, they, I'll tell you, if you ever want to get into an emergency room that's packed, tell them you have rhabdo. Because uh, they got me in within like 20 minutes to the emergency room, and that everybody else was waiting hours. So... Um, they got me in there, hooked me up to fluids, ran a bunch of blood tests, and um, two things I think really helped me. Um, I knew that I probably had rhabdo, so I, as soon as I saw the darker year and I was looking for it and I got in there, so most people don't go to the hospital for sore arms for days, right? And by then, this stuff has built up in their body. But luckily, I had been drinking a lot of fluids, which was flushing some of it out, and um, and also going to the hospital as soon as I noticed my urine change colors, um, I, I kind of got ahead of it. Uh, there have been so your your normal creatine kinase level, which is what they measure in your blood to to determine whether you have something wrong, uh, is supposed to be between 50 and 200. Um, mine when I got to the hospital was 18,000, and. Over the next two or three days, it actually got up to 24,000, which sounds horrible, and it is. I mean, it's bad. Uh, it's certainly enough to shut your kidneys down, but um, if you don't have medical attention. But I've heard of people that have, you know, had, had numbers in the 100,000 range because they didn't do anything about it until it was almost too late. So, um, so basically, my stupidity, uh, perfect storm. I did pretty much everything wrong with that workout and uh, ended up in the hospital for six days and, and five nights uh, with them uh, pumping fluids and, uh, and, and more fluids into me. At one point, I, they actually, uh, because my numbers kept going up even after I was in there, they actually had two IVs flowing into me, um, you know, as fast as they could push them through for a couple hours. So um, I think in all, they put in... Um, I think it was over 20 liters of fluid in in the five five and a half days, six days that I was in there. I actually gained 15 pounds of water weight on, on the hospital diet. So um, when I came out, I was I was puffy to say the least. But uh, um, that was I, they finally let me out when I was at about 5,000 on my CK numbers. And as of uh, Thursday, when I went back to the doctor, my blood tests were finally back. Uh, my creatine kinase was finally back in the, in the normal range. Um, I lost a lot of strength and a lot of size. Um, I, you know, I said to the doctor, I said, my, my biceps feel, you know, 30, 40% smaller than they were. And he said, well, you know, all that brown stuff you were pissing out, that was your biceps. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, I basically pissed uh, a third of my biceps uh, away in, in two weeks. So uh, just, uh, you know, I, I can't, I can't <clears throat> warn people strongly enough. Uh, when you're starting a new exercise or a new body part or even a new type of exercise, you know, don't, A, don't push yourself. I know we all 
you know, want to be that guy that doesn't say no to pain or, you know, can push through it and be the hero, but start out slow, you know, um, and I, I'm, I'm the worst about this. You know, if I see something I want to do, I go try to do the, the max every time. But uh, anytime you're training a new body part or doing a new type of exercise or even a new type of training, because um, mostly all I do is low rep, high weight training, and then to go, you know, to a muscle part or a body part that I don't normally train and start out with, you know, 115 rep curl set, uh, just, just ignorant. So take it slow, ease in, um, you know, once you become experienced at the movement and know how it's supposed to feel and th that type of training and your muscles get used to it, then you can go ahead and push it. But don't just jump in and, you know, and do, do something crazy like I did. It, uh, it was not fun laying in that hospital peeing every 15 minutes, I can tell you that. So that's my story on Rabdo. I'm an idiot. Well, that's just crazy. Wow, man. Crazy. I that's, never... It, yeah. Go that's ahead. one of those I'm things. Well, well, that's like, you know, you, you know Rabdo is out there, but you, you just, it's like, it's like the Loch Ness Monster or a unicorn. You, you just, you don't think you're ever going to encounter it. You know, it's, Right. It's, you know, I, I've just, and, and, and with something like that, I mean, I'm, I don't want this to come out the wrong way, but I've only heard of like one other person getting rabbed on that was like Yuha, right? And he like, yeah. he, he crushed his legs. I don't know what he did. He, he went and murdered some freaking leg session all day or some shit like that and got, and got freaking rabbed And I was thinking, I never, I didn't know you could hit your arms. I mean, shit, we do like August of arms every year where it's like 30 days of arms training, you know, to try to put a, to try to put an inch on. So to hear a guy go out yeah. and do pound stone curls, which is one of those things that's like uh, I've played with those a few times. That's just, that's just, it, it's horrifying, really. You know, I mean, to think that you can, that, that can happen from something like that. I mean, this is, uh, is. This is something we do often, really. You know, I mean, I, I've not personally banged out uh, 100 or 115 curls on an axle, but I've certainly made the effort. You know, I, I too have died around the 50, 60 rep mark, you know, but um just to think once you once you hit that magical number that it puts you in the hospital, that's just that's just insane. You know. I I've just yeah, I'm in awe of that whole situation. The other thing that's that's kind of scary is I distinctly remember in high school uh going to the weight room for like the first second time ever that I this is the first time I'd ever been to the weight room. And, like, Mike was talking about how he couldn't straighten his arms. That was me. I couldn't straighten my arms for several days. So you really have to wonder, was something like that going on? Because back in the day, I didn't drink water, man. It was like no. some kind of soda. <laughs> soda I, nobody milk. did, yeah. That's all, that's Anybody all that's, that's worked out has had mild rhabdo. And after going through it, I, I think I've probably – my son was telling me about – when he thought he had it in one of his arms. So, um, but you, you know, I, I, there's mild and then there's, I guess when your pee turns brown, that's really the, I guess that's really the key, but who knows, you know, maybe you don't even notice it. Maybe you just think you're dehydrated, but it's, uh, it was crazy. I think, um, I think the main takeaway is if you train biceps and you've built up to where, uh, or any, any body part, and you've built up to where you're used to doing high rep, work or a lot of work, there's not much danger, right? And stay hydrated, make sure you're getting carbs, that sort of thing. There's, there's not much danger unless you really do something crazy. Um, it's it's kind of when you're first starting, I think, is the biggest, scariest point um, for this or the biggest risk point. I just, I never have been a curl guy. Um, I've never been a guy that's worried about having that big biceps peak or whatever. Um, the only thing I worry about my biceps are, are they, str are they strong enough that I can do heavy rows? And that's most of the bicep work I get is low rep rows. So for me to just jump in and do that, probably, well, not probably, it was, it was ignorant. Um, but for something like August of Arms, you know, if it's guys that have already been working their arms for a while and are used to doing high sec, you know, high rep sets, probably not that not that big of a worry. I mean, maybe you start out a little slower at the beginning of it to ramp up, but or or tell people, hey, August to arms is coming. 
make sure you're you're getting prepared for this. Um, yeah. But it was a fluke. I mean, like I said, I had everything working against me. It was funny that every doctor I saw and every nurse, when I told them I had, when they came in and looked at my chart and saw rhabdo, they said, so you do CrossFit. So apparently <laughs> this, this must be, uh, this must be, well, not common at all. It is, uh, I guess, more prevalent in, you know, in the CrossFit community and, and some of these boot camp type places that aren't CrossFit that get a newbie in there. And then, you know, there are a lot of good boxes, um, but there are some that, you know, the guy comes in off the street and they expect him to, to join the class and push through the pain and do whatever. And, and that's, right. that's kind of where you get it from. But yeah, I got a lot of that. So you do CrossFit. Yeah. Do I look like I do CrossFit? <laughs> So Is that getting in your head where you're like, oh, oh shit, I'm, I'm getting all yeah, I need to start like, eating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you were just complimented. <laughs> so, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think one thing that is important to point out is just because you are following a ketogenic diet doesn't mean you're going to get rhabdo. Just absolutely not. Just because you do poundstone curls doesn't mean you're going to get rhabdo. Just because you're dehydrated doesn't mean you're going to get rhabdo. But at the same time, it's probably a good idea to keep, you know, stay aware aware of all those factors because it is a possibility. So, I, what were you I, so are you? Alan? Yeah, any well, one you? or two of those probably isn't. You're not going to get rhabdo. But when you do all three, in a right. hot, in a hot, humid, eighty-five, ninety-degree shed. And you're not used to doing them. You're you're tempting fate. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm assuming you didn't, you know, jump off the keto diet, scarf a bunch of carbs, and start doing curls again. How are things? What what is your what are you yeah. doing now as far as how things are? Yeah, I took two weeks off everything. Um, the doctor said I can go back to working out everything normally, which for me is heavy and low rep, uh, other than my biceps. So I haven't done any rows, any curls. I, I may never do another curl as long as I live, so, and I'm okay with that. Um, so I haven't done any rows, no curls, nothing that, that directly hits the biceps. I've done some grip work, some sledge work, uh, hit the napalm's nightmare heavy. I think uh, uh, I got, uh, took the handles off and, and actually pulled 625 the other day for some holds. But again, arms locked out, no biceps at all. Um, but that was after I got the green light that, that my numbers were back to normal and, and I was good to go. I just, I've got to take it really slow to build my bicep strength back up. They're, they're really weak right now. And, and I, and it's, it's amazing how much smaller they are. Um, I mean, I, my biceps are, are noticeably smaller. Probably if I had to guess, I've lost at least a third of the mass that were there. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when you, you mentioned, like, I, I've never heard, you know, you could get keto from, or keto, uh, rhabdo from curls. You always think of, like, the bigger muscle groups. And that's, that's when it's really scary. If you, if you, you know, your biceps only have so much mass, right? So you can only do so much damage to your body. They, they can only put out so many toxins. If, if when it's really serious is when somebody um, gets this, uh, because of a, a back workout or what's really common are leg workouts. You have yeah. so much muscle mass there, and when you kill those muscles and they eject, I mean, they've seen numbers as high as like 180,000. So, you know, mine, the highest it ever got was 24,000, which is still ridiculous when you think 200 is the normal or below 200. But so, yeah, it's, I was lucky it was just my biceps and, hey, I've never had, you know, I've never had big, big arms like Jed anyway. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah, that sucks Who when has, that happened, you know. He's, he's got big arms. Don't let him, or he did anyway, maybe not <laughs> right now, but he's got, he's got good sized arms. He's got oh. me in traps and, and yoke and all that stuff anyway. But, what uh, else, anything else important that we need to talk about here, Mike, as nope. a public service announcement? Just, just be careful when you're starting out anything new and make sure you're hydrated and yeah. and don't be afraid to, to eat a little bit of uh, good clean carbs even if you're doing keto before or after a workout and and yeah. 
don't be stupid like me. Well, thanks for talking to us today on that, Mike. Um, why don't we go ahead and switch over to the other topic that we were going to talk about, and Alan's going to head this one up. It's the history of the Captain's the Crush certification. So, uh, Alan, where are we going to start with this, buddy? All right. Well, so um, in looking at one of your recent videos, Jed, um, you posted on YouTube. This was on, on, on your regular channel. Um, you'd been receiving a number of questions about the, the Captain's the Crush certification and, oh, yeah. and, and how people go about doing that certification. Um, you know, we have other, other certifications through Iron Mind, like their Crush to Dust Challenge and things like that, where people, for the most part, can just, can just host those challenges, you know, uh, at will when they please and with really minimal documentation. But the, the gripper certs, it's, it's much more involved than that, really. Um, there's, a, there's a process through actually contacting Iron Mind, and, and I think they actually... I think they're actually looking for some, some level of verification even that you are indeed able to close such and such a gripper before they're going to, you know, line up the ref, get the gripper sent to you, and, and then actually have you, you know, make your certification attempt. So I wanted to hear your thoughts about that, where we've, where we've gone through the years with the Captains of Crush certifications because it's, it's evolved through time. You know, it originally started out one way where I think it was like a, a parallel set, you know, or, or some, some level of set like we see on the Mass Monster certifications, and then it gradually spread out to the, to the credit card set over the course of many years. Um, yeah. But, but there's not a lot that we see about that. You know, um, some of the threads that get started on, like, the grip board, for example, kind of get heated with regards to some of those things. They get shut down pretty quick, so we never get to hear a lot of the information. And even yeah. what Iron Mind has on their own site, uh, we really don't, we really don't see a lot either where that transition um, came, you know, how, how, it, how it became. So um, you'd definitely be the guy to, to give us some of, the, some of the ins and outs of that. I believe you were on the, the crew that had certified under the, under the previous rules. That's right. Um, so why don't you tell us a little about that, how that became. Yeah, and uh, Mike, if I say something that uh, you remember something along those lines and it's real important, make sure you, you inject because uh, you, you've you been around quite a while too. So sure. basically, so I found out about the certification, and, and the reason this came up with the video is because I do get a lot of questions about, can I come up and certify the gripper with you, Jed? And the answer is, no, you can't just do that. So when I found out about it, it was way way back in 2002. Uh, Rick Walker was talking about it on the Dr. Squat forum. And uh, I didn't really get into it right away. But over time, after watching Rick post about it so passionately, I was like, wow, I really want to want to get into this. So the way that it worked back then was you, you buy the grippers, you, you train your ass off until you're closing the three, and what you had to do was contact Iron Mind, and they would, they would actually find a witness or a referee or whatever you would call it to verify your clothes. And you also had to send in a still shot of, your, of the clothes. So there was actually a two-part certification. And I went to the fitness headquarters in... Um, it's either Johnson City or Binghamton, New York. I'm not sure. They're, they're right beside one another. And Bob Thomas uh, certified me. He filled out the paperwork, sent it in to Dr. Strassen, as I recall. And then it was up to me to get a picture of the clothes. And I'll be damned if I didn't get, like, the worst case of tennis elbow in history. And uh, I, I struggled for weeks to get a close uh, on film. Because um, back then, remember, this is this is actually when I certified it was it ended up being December of 2013, or I'm sorry, December of 2003. My bad, December of 2003 is when I did the certification at at uh, with Dave Thomas, and then to get the picture it took me a couple weeks, and uh, not everybody had the the cell phones. No, like nobody had cell phones back then, let alone a phone that would be able to take a picture. So. It was all with, like, a Canon camera that I had, and I'd have to take, like, 24 pictures on a 24, uh, you know, uh, a pack of film with 24 shots in it, and then I'd have to take them to get developed, and then that would be a few days. 
So I'm going through rolls and rolls of film. A lot of people probably don't even know what a roll of film looks like. And uh, <laughs> I went through rolls of film in order to get one still shot. And, um, you know, I remember back in the day, I think it might have been like Heath uh, Sexton that put up a post on the board about the best way to capture a close. And I was doing all inside in a gym with the um, fluorescent lights or whatever. And uh, ended up, I finally ended up getting it, I think, uh, by going outside and taking the picture. So, you know, I would close it, but I, my hand would be trembling because I was in so much pain at the time. So it was really hard to get the picture. So finally we got the picture. You send it in the iron mine, and then you get a notification that you're, you, you've been certified, and then it ends up in the Milo catalog. So that's how it was back in the day. And, yes, you're right, uh, Alan. Back in the day, you could use whatever set you wanted, but the wording on the rules was, the last inch of the close had to be clearly visible for the referee to see. So that is actually where the MASH Monster certification requirement of a parallel set comes from because in, what, 2004 maybe is when they, they changed the rules so you had to use a credit card for the set depth, and that is what really set a lot of people off and made people very, very upset that the rules were changed in that way. So when the MASH Monster set was developed, they wanted a way to be able to do it without the use of some kind of technology like a, a camera. And um, instead, what was, you know, for the still shot, I'm saying, so you would film the, the thing. We didn't want to have uh, a referee involved, so you would film it and you would send it in, and then there would be judges that would look at the video that you sent in. And then they would have to be able to clearly see both a parallel set because how are you going to measure an inch on a video? You know, it's, it's almost impossible to measure the distance of an inch. But you can tell parallel pretty easily just by looking at parallel lines of the gripper. So that made it real easy. And then uh, getting a still shot um, was generally easy, if it was, especially if it was mashed like, uh, like Ches did on the certification that you mentioned earlier. So that's where it started, as I recall, and it, you know, it was from, I probably looked into it first in 2002 and ended up certifying in 2003, and then as I recall, it changed in 2004. And uh, when, I, when I started, it was only the, the number three and the number four certification because there weren't even any 3.5 grippers out there. The 3.5 cert didn't come on until much later, and I don't even know when that was. But uh, that's how that's how it all started when I was involved, when I got involved. That must have been about the end of 2004, by the looks at it. I'm just going down the list right now, and you can see all the people. There's like a boatload in the early, you know, 2001, 2002, up to 2004, and then all of a sudden, bang, you know, like in 2004, for example, it looks like there's maybe 15, 20 people. And then 2005, there's six. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it it's like been, a drastic drop-off. It drop may have off. been the end of 2004. Yeah, it may have been the end of 2004. But 2003, mm -hmm. there was, I don't know, it seems like there was like, I want to say there was 100 people certified on the number three, or maybe it was a total of 100 people. Um, oh, it must have been a total. Yeah, probably the Actually, total. There's a, and there's a lot of people that were so appalled by the change of the set that they wrote in and asked to have their name taken off the list. So I, I believe Rick Walker Rick. was one of those guys. Yes, that's right. Rick Walker was one. I want to say Josh Dale was another that said that he was displeased with the decision that was made to please take his name off the list. Yeah, I think that's right, Jen. So, I think Josh did. Yeah. yeah. I thought, um, so, uh, I thought yeah. the, the story with Rick Walker was that um, – he wanted his name taken off the list, and not because of the, the set change, but because he couldn't close it from the current rules. So he couldn't close it from a, from a credit card set. So I, did, I thought, at least that was my interpretation, that he didn't think he should belong on the list. Well, yeah, I don't... I mean, that could be it, too. That could be it, too, buddy. Yeah, I think most of the people of those first 100 couldn't have closed it with a credit card set. That was the, you know... Oh, we've... We've all seen some of those really there there were a lot of questionable videos yeah. <laughs> of of the clips that well, I've seen. 
Yeah, yeah. and unfortunately, there was, a, there was a point in time where, in 2003, 2004, the... You there, Mike? I am now. Okay. Did we lose Jed? I think we lost Jed. Okay. Well, he'll chime back in in a second. <laughs> so, but yeah, it was just, um, you know, yeah. when you look at that list, it's a ton of people, you know, up until that time frame. And then it drops off. And then you can actually see, like, um, you know, right around, it looks like actually 2008. Um, that's when we started seeing a bunch of the big monsters start showing up. You know, the guys like... Uh, Andrew Derniat, Gabriel Sum, you know, yep. Rich Williams. It seems like some of those big people come back in, and that's when the numbers kind of picked up a little bit. Yeah, I agree. So it, I think people started getting more comfortable with the credit card set, too, and, and trained it more. Um, you know, it's like anything. Uh, nobody hit, you know, everybody did grippers from kind of an MMS or shallower, if you look at some of those videos. I mean, I'm not even sure anything was ever – open on some, some of those number four closes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I, I wasn't going to, I was definitely going to stay away from that one today, but um, I guess we could go there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It, well, it, I mean, I think it's good that they tightened it up, you know, tightened the, tightened the rules up from kind of some of the original ones. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but, but doing, you know, showing that you closed a gripper in a dark shed on a grainy video with a relative as a uh as your witness was probably not the best way to go but then to completely change basically the feet i mean it's it's two different things right uh, it, an mms set or a uh a credit card set um yes it's 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 really two different things so um i'm you know it's uh but hey, it's their company, their rules, their whatever. I'm I'm probably not the best guy to ask. I, I may be the only person on the uh, red nail uh, that inserted a red nail and asked to have his name removed from the list as well. So um, I, I'm I'll just leave it at that. Oh, I hadn't I hadn't heard that I hadn't heard that that story. What what's uh, had had rules changed with the with the nail bending through the years? Is that is that what happened there too or? Yeah, well, when the red nail started, you could use leather wraps, you could use whatever, um, and then it got down to you had to use IM pads, and the nails got sharper and whatever. I, I actually certified on the harder rules. I just uh, um, I had an issue with the way they were, were were treating some of the newer guys in the sport versus the the uh, the heroes of the IM board. Uh, those old time strong men that were greater than anybody that will ever come after them. So I, uh, I, oh, just, okay. I, I just told him I didn't want my name associated with that and please take me off the list. And, and Randall was, was nice enough to do that. Um, you know, no hard feelings. I just, uh, I'd rather not have my name associated with their company. Okay. I see. I see. Fair enough. But yeah, no, I, um, Red nail cert definitely has changed over time. The original guys did it in thick double leathers, and uh, you know now you have to do it with the really thin Cordura pads, and um, you know the nails seem to have gotten sharper and sharper as time has gone on, and and things like that. But uh, um, so yeah, m much like the the number three cert, um, it, it's definitely a harder cert today than the first. 20 or 30 guys that got on the list. Sure, sure. Okay, all right. Had you ever taken an attempt at the at one of those certifications? It's probably, uh, I, I suppose it's a moot point now, but based yeah, on the previous I, I, I've started on the, on the red nail and then had them take my name off the list. So I actually, you know, got my name and picture in Milo and had my name on the list uh, several years ago. I think I did it in, in an Ikea parking lot in 2010 or 11, maybe. Um, and I've, I've closed a number three with a credit card set, an easy number three, but I'm, I'm a long way away from certain on one today, but it's not something that I would ever. Not on your list anyway. Ever, ever train for now. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, fair enough. Yeah. Yep. Well, um, I just got a message from Jed. It looks like he's trying to get back on. Um, I don't think he realized he dropped out. So, but, um. 
No, that, that list was interesting. Um, you know, if I remember, and this is something I think I had seen it on the grip board with regards to why some of that stuff had changed, but I think the deal was that when, when Randall Strawson decided to go with the credit card set, I believe it was because one time he was at a certification attempt and the person, I think they, uh, they, they basically wound up bending the rules just a little bit too far for his taste, I yep. think. And, um, and, and, and in fact, closed the gripper. But um, in his mind, that was like, okay, well, that's it. If people are going to do it this way, we're going to, you know, have something with a little more, a little more consistency. Yeah. And I don't know if, the, if, if it was that day that also that, you know, when the credit card set was born and then it was the new out-of-the-box gripper or, or how that exactly worked. Because once upon a time, you could use, like, you know, the gripper you had in your, oh, yeah. you know, in your gym bag, yep. you know. Absolutely. So maybe I think and people Jed were, jump back in. People literally were shipping around. They would find the easiest number three out there, and people were literally shipping, paying to have somebody ship them that gripper so they could cert on an easy number three gripper. Sure. Sure. Okay. That that's interesting. I guess I'm not surprised to hear that. I hadn't heard that story, but that would make sense. Yeah, you know, no, we hear about people like out there that several people certed on the same gripper. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's true. I heard that. I heard that as well. I am back. I don't know what happened. Sorry about that, guys. Go ahead. Oh, that's all right. Um, yeah, you heard the rumors about people like throwing them on the ground and, and stomping on them the week in the spring <laughs> and things like that. You know. So, uh, foot stomping, foot stomping, that's what it was called. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So just crazy. But, but Jed, does that, does that sound right to you when the, when the rules changed, were they all born at the same time or was there a gradual, you know, evolution there? Did we go straight to credit card and, and new gripper out of the package or do you recall what that progression was? Hmm. Well, you're definitely right that you could use your own gripper. Um, I want to say that there was a time where you had to show the depth of the credit card with your own gripper first, but I don't think it lasted very long. I don't, I don't think it lasted very long at all, and I think they started to ship the, the grippers out uh, pretty soon after that. But I, see, is, okay. I seem to think that there was a time where you could still use your own gripper, but you had to use that deeper or uh, the more shallow set with the credit card indicator. Okay, okay. All right. But I I don't know for certain. I don't know for certain. They could they could have come out at the same time and that's that's a good question, Alan. I guess I've kind of blocked that one out. No, no, I was just I, I didn't I don't remember seeing anything about how that worked. I just knew some of their some of their criteria changed quite a bit. I remember um, you know, for example, John McCarter one time. Uh he's a he's a COC three. And um he when he went to make his first attempt, I think I don't believe he started the gripper at that time. But I think when he initially um, contacted Iron Mind, I think they said, you know, why don't you train a little longer and then, you know, then come back and try this or something like that. They literally had that, that conversation with him. So I don't know that they, you know, when you contact them and say, hey, I'm ready to shut this thing, that they just give it to you. I think they want something. It, it's almost like they, they, they want some credentials almost, you know, like some, right. like some proof that you're truly capable. They and definitely do now. I, I know that I know that they do now just from talking to people that have certified that they uh, they they don't want to just send a gripper out to someone who says they're ready because they're basically just giving them a free gripper because they don't make you pay for that gripper. Right. Yes. That was uh, I, and I actually think that's 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 pretty awesome of them as a company to yeah. to line that oh, up absolutely. and then and then do that. But I but really yeah, are, um, I'm going to try to cert. <laughs> Start building your gripper uh, collection back up, right, Rindo? No. Yeah, I think but I wondered that, how that. In fact, I think for the red nail to get a cert scheduled, I had to show them that I could bend a red nail too in IMP. So. Yeah, you, you demonstrate it first, that sort of thing. Yeah, that would kind of that would kind of fit, I would think nowadays. Yeah, and, so. I, that's what the, and that's the same thing with the Mash Monster certs. You know, I mean, on the grip board, they. You know, you have to get an MM0 first. You have to show that you can close your number three at home um, before they'll even, you know, uh, under certain conditions, before they'll even send you the MM1. So I think yeah. that's reasonable. Yeah, yeah, that is, a, that is a good way of doing that. So 
I think there was well, even a time, if I remember correctly, with the Mash Monster, where you had to be a Captain of Crush in order to take the Mash Monster. <clears throat> oh, really? Yeah, I think your, name, your name had to be on the on the list in order to try it, if I remember correctly. Man, oh, okay. Okay. My, my memory, though. <laughs> And, and then they but, uh, they must have they must have just loosened they loosened that up then somehow yeah, yeah. I wonder what that and there was okay. also okay. a time there was also a time where you could use like a, a um, either I think it was a beef builder elite if you had a beef builder elite and you closed that because some people swore off the captains of crush they would never train on them again um, it was just such a it was it just left such a sour taste in their mouths that some people weren't gonna train on captains of crush anymore. Which is, which is unfortunate because, you know, it's not just Iron Mind trying to be buttheads. I mean, they were trying to do something um, with a with a clear-cut reason behind it. Whether or not it was that popular or not, I can't, I, I'm definitely not going to say that. But um, I really don't think they did it completely out of spite. But that's that's how a lot of people took it. And, you know, some people are are loyal to a certain decision that they make. And, and that's, that's what they do. So that's not mm-hmm. wrong either, I guess. Sure. Well, maybe that explains the birth of the, the, the GHP grippers, too, then, around that time, if that's part of the case. You know, were some people not well, wanting to, I don't know, speculate. <laughs> well, I remember, that, uh, I remember that Wade Gillingham talked about all of the research and the testing that they did in order to manufacture grippers that were of a quality that were very, very consistent so that you had the same handle spread, you had the same spring strength. Because the way that it worked with the COC grippers, you know, even the, in, in 2004, even the number fours were light. So that's why you see number fours that have rated 191. Um, and that, those were probably some of the number fours that got certified back in the day with the, with the original set. So um, they didn't want to have grippers that were you know, three inches one time and then two and three quarters the next. And I have some number threes that are extremely wide. I bought one from Jeff Peterson way back in the day, probably 2004 or something like that. It was extremely wide, super, super wide, probably the widest number three I ever saw. And, um, you know, so another variation story that I had was I bought one off a guy whose name on the grip board was Shrug. His name was actually James Smith, and he trained a lot of times with, Rick Walker and Steve McGranahan, and his number three that I bought off of him, he sold it to me after he certified. He he cut it, he filed it, and no one it would never be like a legit gripper to certify on again. And that's probably even lighter than my 139 rated number three. So even filed, that, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh I can, wow. Yeah, to take it to like the would be closed position if it weren't filed is. It feels like a two and a half. It literally feels like a two and a half. Oh wow! But it was. Uh, I don't know if that was one of the grippers that got shipped around or not. But it was. It was definitely a light gripper. Yeah. I when I when I bought my first number three, I hadn't been doing grippers long. I bought a two and a half and closed that, and then I bought a number three and closed it like the second time I tried it. And I thought, man. These guys act like this is tough. Well, I came to find out. I, you've got that gripper, I think, now, Jed. I think I sold that to you when yeah. I gave up all my grippers. But I think it was like 140 or 142 at the most. I mean, it was an easy number three. And then, and then yeah. I, I tried somebody else's and was like a half an inch from close. And I was like, oh, okay, I get it. Right. Yeah. Well, and then uh, more on the variation, I went to York Barbell in 2003 or four. And I actually, they had, they used to have a, a whole stack of grippers that you could try that were right on the desk. So you yep. just walk in there, grab them, squeeze them. And I took a picture on that old Canon camera of a stack of grippers, and like none of the, none of the spreads were the same, none right. of them. And I was yep. able to close one of the threes, but not the other because the other, the other three had a spread that was probably a half inch lar- larger, and it was that much harder to close. It was, it was very, very hard. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. Well, it's cool hearing some of that stuff because I never, I, you know, being being relatively, you know, I've only been involved in this for just about, about three or four years now, so I didn't yeah. get to hear some of the some of the history and how some of these things became, you know. So yeah, 
getting a couple of guys on the phone and actually talking about it, that's 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 pretty cool hearing a hearing a lot of the sides of that. Yeah. yeah I, so that's I mean that's is, really how the cert. Go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. No, I'm just I was just gonna say as mad as people got, like I said before, I think what they were trying to do was a good thing. Was tighten up the rules. I mean, if you there's a reason why nobody has certed a number four. Um, since then, even this, these huge monsters that are into grip now, like Rich Williams and and some of the names you named. I mean, you know, you got I mean monsters out there that are that are into grip now. Um, that, that and nobody has since they've changed the rules has asserted a number four. If you even if you talk to Cashton, the guy we were talking about that did what are, what ten reps uh, on his number four that he had, to, you know, uh, with a with a uh, a narrow set. Um, he even says, I think, in the comments on his YouTube video, he's nowhere close to certain on that with a credit card because um, it's just so different. And yeah. so th- there's there's a there's a big reason, you know. I if if you look, uh, and again, uh, you know that uh, anyway, a 180 pound guy doing basically a no set close on some gripper he had in a dark shed. Um, you know, you, you had to get away from that or it was just going to lose all credibility. Now, whether Absolutely. whether going to, a, you know, to whatever a credit card is, two and a quarter or two inches for the set was the right decision, that can be debated. Um, but like I said before, their company, their rules, their grippers, uh, you know, whatever they want to do there, right? Um, you know, maybe they right. could have... It, uh, I think they probably chose a credit card because that's the everybody has a credit card, right? Or everybody knows that size. But maybe they could have gone to a one-inch block, or you know, to kind of keep the spirit of the of the cert um, the same as it was before. Uh, but th- those are things you can argue about. But I think the fact that they actually came up with some rules um, and got rid of you know and, and and made you do it on a new gripper, I think that was all all for the best. I, I yeah, actually, I, I actually, I like that concept too. But I, I further like it that, um, you know, with the way, well, specifically using it in in terms of the four, for example, how you you made the point that we, you know, nobody has done that yet. I actually like the idea of of, of feats out there that are almost they're literally not attainable. Or if somebody does get it, it'll be like the one guy, like what we've seen on on the Mass Monster ladder, for example. You know, there's one MASH Monster 8. You know, other people have tried and failed. I kind of like that top of the pyramid kind of thing. Yep. And um, so it's, a, it's just, I, from, from my point of view, I think that's really impressive. Like, there, there can be only one concept, you know. <laughs> that's a, my weird way of looking at it, I guess. But I, but I, I, I don't think it should be for everybody. You know, I just think that the, 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 the elite few should be the ones that can get it. You agreed. know, so. I don't know, hey, Jed, so, would you? Say that the three and a half now is probably a three and a half cert now with the credit card is probably as big a feat or as hard a feat as the number four cert used to be back in the day. Yeah, I'd say they're they're quite close to parallel. Yeah, yeah, because it's at least with the three point five, it's it's within reach, and you're seeing people do that like once or twice a year. Yeah. So so you're you're seeing a lot of similarities with the statistics at least. Um, unfortunately, I still think that credit card set is still a little bit wide for a smaller-handed individual to really get the leverage they need in order to close it. I agree. Because, yeah, if you can close a number one with a credit card set, I suppose physically, then you have the what it takes to close the 3.5, but you're still talking about a lot of variables that have to be locked in just totally perfectly, and there's so much stuff going on in the hand with all the joints and, and uh, the, the angular strength and, and all that stuff it, it really makes it hard but yeah i think that's a good point that you make yeah i was just looking at the looking at the list you, you look at the number <clears throat> well there's literally five people i think that have started on the on the four and i'm get you know we were talking about the rule change that literally must have happened around around 2004 because nobody has started on the four since then so that must have been when right. that when that rule got implemented it but now versus the, um, you take that number and compare it to the 3.5s, this is with regards to, yeah, it's still a really small list. You know, when you look at it, it looks like that must have developed around the 2008 mark, but there can't be more than 
you know, just at a glance here, maybe 15, 20 people in total. So, yeah. Even some big windows where nothing happened at all, you know, from, from, there's one guy in 2015, nobody did it in 2014, and we've seen it twice in 2018 now. So, mm-hmm. yeah, some big jumps in there from when those things had taken place. Joe you know. Musselwhite put together some kind of a, a collection of data, if you will, uh, as far as like the changes to the grippers themselves. I don't remember where that was, whether it was on the grip board or if he put that on the blog that he ran for a while, but um, that might go into a little bit more detail on when exactly the the cert process changed and when the half grippers came out. Um, I want to say that in 2006, when Smitty and I ran the Global Grip Challenge down to Sorenex, I don't think we had the I don't think we had the half grippers by then. And you said oh, okay. the 3.5 cert was the first one was in 08, Alan. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. As I recall, when I got into grip in that 07, 08 time frame, I can't remember the exact year I started. They were still advertising them as something new, like here's your stepping stone grippers to the number three or the number four. So. I right. think those must have come out in 2007-ish. Yeah. That would fit. Well, that would all fit. Yeah, so 2007, I'm trying to think. I, I, I remember things by the contest that we ran. So 2006 was down to Sorenex. 2007 and 2008 were at the edge in Tawanda. And one of those is the year that Derniat, we, we ran the credit card set, and Derniat went for a 3.5 and, with a credit card set and nearly closed it, but in the process uh, nearly passed out. He browned out and went out of the camera and almost spiked his head through the wall. So that was 2000, oh and it was probably 2008. And then 2009, 2010, we're in my garage, and Rindo was up for one of those. Was that 2008? I think it was 2009. 2009? Okay. So 2009, yeah, 07 and 08 was, yeah, 07 and 08 was at the edge. 09 and 10 were at my garage. 2011 was at Chris Rice's. I actually went out to Ohio to run it, and Rindo was there. Yeah. And then 2012 was when Derniat took it over for several years at his gym. So, but I, as I recall, I think it was 2008 when we first ran the um, the half grippers. It was either 2000 or, 2007 or 2008 because we were definitely at the edge when it happened. And um, we ran those rules in 2006 because uh, Randall Strassen actually came to Sorenex for that event in 2006 and then they sponsored us the next at least the next year so they sent us a bunch of grippers and gift certificates and stuff like that so we used their their gripper rules so yeah so that's 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 what i recall nice <clears throat> well i have one thing i'd like uh, to add about the the captains of crush grippers here um for anybody that's that's listening and might not be aware that it's not strictly a men's certification, that they do also have the the number 2 and 2.5 available for, for women to certify on. Right. And it looks like we are well past due for, for having some women cert the number 2. There's only uh, three on the list, as a matter of fact. Uh, Adrian uh, Blewett, Amy Waddles, and Elizabeth Horn. So those are three names I've definitely seen around. And off the top of my head, I know one lady that's ready right now to start the number two, if not, could go on and smash the 2.5, and that's, that's Becca Roberts, of course. But, oh, um, sure. yeah, but just, just for the record, anybody that's listening, that is an opportunity out there. So I know we're starting to see more and more women getting into grip, and I, I, I definitely think there's some people out there that could, that could get on that list if they were interested. So. Yeah, no doubt about it, and we're trying to get women involved at the Northeastern grip challenge that's at the WAL meet in July on the 21st. 
There's going to be a women's category for that as well. And uh, we're going to run four events, but we're also, I mean, we'll probably also have some other toys there to try. And the grippers are really easy to bring, so if any women would like to try those out, we'll have them. So, yeah. Yeah, I just caught that recent. Captain's a crush. Yeah, that was a lot of good information. I hadn't heard some of those some of those stories. So, some of the things that that Mike brought up, that was that was interesting. And uh, it's it's a shame it it came to some of that uh, that type of behavior, but um, uh, cool to hear anyway. Oh, well, yeah. You know, personally, I, I'm I'm one of those guys that I guess I'd I'd rather get it the I'd rather get it the hard way than to do it the, you know, I'd, I don't want to, like, chip paint off of something to make it, you know, so chalk can stick to it easier. I'd right. rather never lift it than do something like that. So the, the thought of smashing a gripper with my foot to make it so I can close it to get on a list, that's just kind of, I, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. It's just a, it's just a cheat, you know. <laughs> that's all there is yeah. to it. So, yeah, um, um, I, hex, I got a hold of a gripper one time to rate, and you could tell that someone did that and. um Chris Rice, it was, I think it was Chris Rice and Sean Dockery were around when I was talking about this really weirdly formed gripper that I had gotten a hold of, and uh, they were saying that that was probably a foot stomped gripper because it actually warps the spring, because they do it for so long it heats the spring and it warps it, it actually uh, malforms it, and instead of the the legs being straight and dog legged like they're supposed to be, they end up becoming curved throughout that you know, that inch, inch and a half or whatever it is of the of the spring that comes out of the loop. Interesting. I'm having a hard time yeah. envisioning how a person would actually accomplish that task. They must jack that thing up I somehow guess, or I don't what know. What I heard was they would stick like a, a bar or a pipe through the spring and then that way the gripper couldn't move around. Because if you actually try to stand on a gripper, it's really hard to squeeze it all the way down together because eventually with uh, – with that skew of the spring, your handles don't go straight down and it ends up kicking off to yeah, the right. So what, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. What they have to do is they have to put it, put a bar or something through the spring so that the gripper stays in position, and then you can foot stomp it. And That's just crazy. that motion, because they're doing it, you know, probably not even a hundred times. Probably like several hundred times they're doing it in order to get the spring to. It's not just seasoning the gripper; it's it's distorting the spring. What is right. Yeah, you know, with my luck, I'd have done something like that and rolled my ankle. You know, I'd have, <laughs> I'd have gone up to the surf on crutches. You know, Rindo would have gotten an ingrown toenail that would have caused a staph yeah. infection and some kind of blood blood disease. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just stomped on it so many times, I would have gotten rabdo in my leg. So <laughs> <laughs> I I just if you. If you to get a cert or to do a video or a feat, uh, you got you got more self-esteem problems than than a good gripper close is gonna gonna solve. Yes, no kidding. <laughs> for sure. And we've had well, people that have come back and apologized for their behavior to the com- community too. Really? Um, oh no yes, kidding. They've owned up to that. There's a, what? They, they somebody What's has that? owned up to, to to some of that sort of stuff. That's yeah. cool. Yes, there was um, a guy named, he would go by Timmy. Timmy. And he, he had all kinds of fake profiles on the gripper, on the grip board and stuff like that and put up all these fake gripper closes and stuff. His name's Sam Scott, and he actually apologized to Wanna Grip for his behavior because he was just a, he was like a teenager. And he was, you know, he found out about it, thought grippers were, or he thought that the way that people trained grippers and were so obsessed with them was silly and, you know, he apologized for his behavior, and now now he makes, for what I can tell, legitimate posts on the grip board. Sam yeah. Scott. He was, yeah, he was basically a kid trolling everybody, as I recall. Yep. Oh, interesting. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, the site and the Warren site, too, I think he was, uh, he was pretty active on for a while. Yeah. Well, I definitely know that name. I'd, I'd seen that name. I hadn't seen him post in a while, but I, I didn't know. Well, you know, like I said, a lot of those... A lot of those threads, anything that gets heated seems to get locked down pretty quick or even, I don't know if they get deleted, but it's hard to find some of that stuff. You know, you search, there's, certain, there's certain trigger names that come up and you just, you just can't find the information that you want anymore, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. Right. Interesting. Okay. 
Well, no, that was uh, that, that was that was good hearing all that stuff about the. Hey, the, the other one we didn't talk about was people that used to take a blowtorch to the springs too to to deform them. That I've heard that went on as well back in the day. You know, I've heard that too. I forgot about that. I only heard about that one time, um, and it was I don't I'd never heard of someone that did it. I just I just heard it. Right. People were. Doing and me it. too. They said you could do it when they when they were when they were the darker springs. When they went to the chrome, it would kind of leave a, you could tell if you looked at them closely, I guess, but I guess it, people had tried to, to heat them up to, I don't know what it does, season it. Being a steel bender, that kind of, to me, seems like it would work hard in it, but, but maybe, it's, maybe it's different with a spring, or you just use it to deform, I don't know. But, uh, or maybe you do it right before you close it so that it's really soft. I, I don't know. I, I don't know, man. That's That's... Metallurgy and all that stuff, no idea. No idea. <laughs> Someone to talk Give to you about a bunch that of... might be like uh, a Paul Knight or a, I don't know, a J.T. Strassner, somebody. I don't know, someone with a more more in-depth knowledge of how that metal reacts to heat. <laughs> Pat Povolitis would probably be a good guy to talk to. He's I've, I've talked to him about stuff like that before. He seems to have a pretty good grasp on it, but yeah. So there's sure. there's some guys out there with some knurling marks melted into their skin. Then anyway, I guess yeah. it serves them right. <laughs> like Raiders of the Lost Ark, that guy that grabs the thing. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yes, yeah, it's had the mark in it, and it left it on his hand, right? Yeah. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. The Papa Shango looking dude. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you remember Papa Shango, Mike? I do. You remember Papa Shango, Alan? I uh, no, that doesn't that doesn't ring no, a bell. No. no, yeah, I, yeah, I knew I knew you wouldn't. But uh, is that some wrestling thing? Wrestler. Is that what that is? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I should have known. He, he I should have played along. He put a he put a spell on the Ultimate Warrior in like 1992, and Ultimate Warrior started puking on TV, and he made uh, like black ink come out of Ultimate Warrior's hair. But he was dressed just like. Uh, uh, what's that black man, like a voodoo, like a voodoo magician looking guy. And he was, he was quite similar, not completely, but rather similar to the guy in what, what movie was it? Raiders of the Lost Ark, Mike? Yeah, but I think, uh, yeah, like, I think that was the, uh, the, the one with the, like the second one, whatever that one yeah. was. Yeah. Jones and the Temple of Doom. That was it. Yeah. He was oh, just, yeah. Like, just like that guy. Yeah. Pretty cool characters back there in like ninety one, ninety two for uh, for WWF. Look him up. Look him up, Alan Papa Shango, <laughs> and the Warrior. Look him up. <laughs> yep. Got to be okay. the same, somewhere. The, the same exact guy that played Papa Shango also played Kama, the fighting machine, and then also uh, the Godfather, who had the hoe train, the <laughs> pimp guy. <laughs> so he played like three different characters, and all of them were, I don't know, somewhat questionable in their own regard. It's, <laughs> it's all entertainment, baby. Yeah, man. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thanks for having me on. Yeah. Thank yeah, you this for was nice on, talking Mike. to you, Mike. Thanks for taking the time with us. Have to have you on again sometime. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So if anybody else has questions about the cert, if there's anything we didn't cover, feel free to leave a question below, and we can cover it at a later time when we'll we'll just dedicate a couple minutes to this in a, another episode of Twig. But otherwise, Alan, the show's yours, dude. Take it away. All right. Well, that's episode 57 of This Week in Grip. Um, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, make sure you uh, like, share, and subscribe. Comment down below, and uh, we'll see you next week with another one. Talk to you then. <laughs>